uh, we've heard from Josh this morning, and as we're excited to have he and his family join us here at Macklin Road, Father, we pray that you would bless us. We pray that you would bless Josh's ministry among us. We pray that we might, in turn, be a blessing to he and his family. Father, we pray for many years uh, together, laboring and, and serving, loving one another, and helping one another go to heaven, Father. We pray that we might do that today and, and in the weeks, the months, and the years to come, if that be your will, Father. Father, we pray for our good elders here. We, we're so thankful for them. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless them as they shepherd the flock here at Macklin Road. But Father, as we turn to your word this morning, Father, we ask that we would, with open hearts and with open Bibles, see what you want us to do, to take responsibility for that, and then to do it with joy in our hearts. Father, we understand that we're breathing the air that we are in our lungs right now because of your grace. We understand that we are who we are because of your grace. We're Christians, we're children of God, children of yours. We are redeemed, saved, forgiven of our sins as we are faithful to your son, Jesus. Help us to be more like him. In the end, that's what we are aiming to do so that we might be with him and you in heaven forever. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to define yourself in five words. Define yourself in five words. And give it some thought. Obviously, I don't expect you to be able to just think of an answer just like that. But go ahead and be thinking of a few words that come to mind. I want to share with you my five words. These are my five words. These are not going to be your five, five words, but they're mine. If someone asked me, Barry, can you define yourself in five words Here's what I would say about myself. Number one, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Uh, that is paramount to who I am. I am a child of God. I am redeemed. I'm forgiven. The blood of Jesus uh, has washed away every sins of mine. And I, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the second thing I would say is I'm a husband. Right? That's a big responsibility. A, a husband uh, and so, I, I, I love my wife, and yeah, that'd be the second thing. And then, number three, I'm a father. I'm a father. God has blessed me and my wife with two beautiful children, Aubrey and Blake. Uh, you know them, you love them. But that, that's something that defines who I am. I'm a father. The fourth one I would say is, well, I'm a son. I'm the son of Barry Gilreath, Jr., and Jody Gilreath, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the fact that I have godly parents who raised me up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and I, I praise God. I thank him for that. The fifth word I would say is I'm a minister, uh, and this relates to that first word. I'm a Christian. You know, I, I am blessed with the privilege and the opportunity to serve the Lord and to serve others in this capacity, and I, I'm so thankful for that. Those are my five words. Those are not probably your five words. But, but you know what I see when I look at all of those five words? When I see that I'm a Christian, a, a husband, a father, a son, and a minister? You want to know what I see? What I see is a whole lot of responsibility. Right? Would you agree with me? To be a Christian means you've got to be responsible for all that the Lord has given you. you know, Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is do or much is expected responsibility I, I've got to pick up that cross and deny myself and follow Jesus I've got to live worthy of the calling by which I have been called I'm a husband if I open up the Bible I, I see that God expects me I, I must be responsible to love my wife just as Christ loved and loves his church It's a big responsibility. I look at my kids and I see responsibility. The Bible tells me not to provoke my children to wrath. 
The Bible tells me to raise up my kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to train up a child in the way that he or she should go so that when he or she is older, they're not going to depart from that. You know, that that's on me as a parent, as a father. And then as a son, I need to honor in my, my father and mother. That's expected of me. And then as, as a minister, it, it's my job to go and to teach others, to serve others, all to the glory of God and none to the glory of myself. That's a whole lot of responsibility. In Galatians 6 and verse 5, our Bible verse a, a moment ago, each one of us has to bear his own weight. The idea is that it's kind of like each of us has our own backpack, and we've all got our own burdens and responsibilities that's got to be placed in that backpack, and I and, and you alone... We are the only ones who shoulder that responsibility. And I know that Galatians 6 and verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'm aware of that. And, and that is needed. You know, there are things in your life where, where you just can't do yourself. You, you cannot bear that responsibility yourself. But there are some things that you and only you can do. And, and me, the same thing. And we understand It is in our best interest to be responsible for what we must be responsible for, yes? Right? It's going to help us in the long run. It's going to help us get to where we want to be. And it's going to not only bless our lives, but it's going to bless the lives of those around us as well. But, but we've got a problem with all of this. The problem is that we are tempted to be irresponsible. Would you agree with me? Here's what I'm saying. There, there's several different things that we can do to shirk responsibility. One thing is we say something like this. Well, I know that I'm expected to do this, but I think somebody else is going to take care of it. Someone else will do this. Someone else will take that responsibility and make sure that it gets done. Or another thing we would say is, well... I know that I'm expected to do this, but you just don't understand. It's not my fault the way that I am. It's just who I am. Or it's, we would even say, you know, it's not my responsibility. Sometimes we like to pass the buck to someone else. Other, another thing we might do is we might detach ourselves from responsibility and detach ourselves from other people. We might say that, well, you know, I'm, I'm not responsible to anyone. I'm not accountable to anyone. I don't know, I don't owe anyone anything. We do this. We delay. We say things like this, well, I'll, I'll do that later. I, I'll get to that when I have the time. Sometimes we just say, no, I'm not going to do it. Or we, we say, I can't do it. Sometimes everything is going well and we are being responsible for what we need to do. And then everything just kind of falls off the tracks. And then we're no longer doing what we need to do. This morning, I want to talk about, as you can figure out, personal responsibility. And I want us to see that in the Lord's church, God expects each of us to be responsible for our own selves. And he has not given unto us all of the same responsibilities. And the way that we're going to see this is expressed in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 is where we will be this morning. Titus chapter 2, go ahead and open up your Bible at this time, and I'm going to turn there with you. I want us to see Paul's instructions to young Titus. Paul's instructions to young Titus. You know, Titus was like me. He was a located minister. He served on the island of Crete there in the Mediterranean Sea. And if you are familiar with the Cretan culture, you know that it was a pagan culture. You know, it was kind of like, you know, this uh, oasis in the middle of the sea where people would come and go. And there was a lot of interaction, you know, a combination of a whole lot of different cultures. But the Cretans, they developed a bad reputation. You know, they, they were synonymous with lying and they just had a, a bad rap. And so here comes the gospel of Christ on the island of Crete, and, and things are looking good. I mean, things are changing, people are changing for the better, but at the same time, there's so much, there's so much history with these people 
And there's a lot of insincerity among some of the Christians that false teachers are running amok and causing a lot of problems on that island and causing a lot of problems in the church. And Paul left Titus there in Crete to set the things that needed to be placed in order or to set in things those things that were remaining. Titus, you've got a job. You, you know, you're not there to vacation. How many of you would like to vacation, you know, in the Mediterranean? You know, that sounds pretty good. But no, 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 Titus, you're there to work. You're there to be a Christian minister. You're there to do the labor of the Lord. And by the way, you're not the only one on that island in that uh, congregation that bears responsibility. Everybody in the Lord's church must be responsible for his or her own actions. And we're going to see that expressed at the beginning of Titus 2 and verse 1. Are you with me? Paul writes to Titus and he says, But as for you, as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now again, Titus is a Christian, just like me, just like you, hopefully. And he's a minister. He, he's an evangelist. Uh, he, he is someone who was like a son to Paul. You know, Paul was, you know, he had that in common with Titus. And Paul kind of trained up Titus, and considered him to be his son, his child in the faith. And so as a good father would do, he says, son, I, I want you to teach healthy instruction. That's, that's what the word sound means. The word sound here literally means healthy. Teach things that are going to help people. Teach things that are going to bring them spiritual health. That is your task, that is your responsibility as a Christian minister there on the island of Crete. Teach those things which are according to or which are fitting for sound doctrine. But Titus, again, he's not the only one that bears responsibility in the churches of Crete. Look at verse 2. He directs his thoughts to the older men. Now, Titus is not one of these. Right? Titus is a younger Christian. But what about those older men? Older men, Paul writes, are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in the faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Again, look at verse 2. Titus, you're a younger Christian. That's what you must do as someone who is a located evangelist there. You need to teach what accords with sound doctrine. But those older men, here's what those older men have to do. Here's their responsibilities. Older men, they must be sober-minded. What do you think of when you think of that term, sober-minded? Here's what I think of. I think of someone who's not affected by any sort of external substance that would cloud his or her judgment. Right? Paul is saying those older men need to have a level head. They need to think clearly. They need to not be altered by any sort of outside interference, outside substance, outside example. They are to see things for how they really are. Older men, that's your job. And then he says, be dignified, or be grave, or be honorable. You need to be someone who is worthy of respect. Self-controlled. Self-controlled is the next one. You cannot just gratify any sort of desire that you might have in your body. You must practice self control. That means that you've got to learn to say no to say no to some things. That also means that you need to learn to say yes to some things. Those things that are good. Resist the evil and embrace the good. Older men, that's your job. Sound in faith. That, there's that word sound. He's saying you need to be someone who has a healthy faith, a healthy love, and the love there is agape, and then a healthy steadfastness. And the word steadfastness or patience there is, 
it gives us the image of a marathon runner. Right? Older men, you're a marathon runner. And you are to cross that finish line with steadfastness. Patient endurance all the way to the end. Older men, that's your job right there. I'm not saying that these are the only things that you're responsible for. And Paul is not saying that either. But these are things that if you are an older man in the Lord's church, you must accept these responsibilities and then go ahead and do them. But again, it's not just the younger men. It's not just the older men. What about the older women? Look at verse 3. Older women, what are you responsible for in the Lord's church? Here's, here's what it is. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior. Reverent in behavior. Not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They, the older women, are to teach what is good. And so train the young women. I'm going to stop there. We'll get to the young women in just a minute. As for now, we're just seeing what are the responsibilities of the older women in the church. Look at those things one by one. Older women likewise, or you know, just as the older men have responsibilities, so too do the older women. The first thing he says, you are to be reverent in behavior. Or in other words, you are to live appropriately in regard to the Lord's will for your life. You are to be an example in the way that you live your life. People must see reverence in the way that you conduct yourselves. And then he says, not slanderers. Do you see that? Do you want to know what that word could also be translated as? Not devils. The Greek word is diablos. And elsewhere in the New Testament is created, or it is translated, I should say, as devil. Old women, older women, you cannot be devils. You cannot be slanderers. You cannot go around and say concerning others, have you heard what so-and-so has done? You, he's saying you cannot make things up about people to harm them your responsibility or slaves too much wine how foolish is this to glorify wine to think that that's fulfillment that that's happiness you're not free you're a slave if you think that way do not be a slave to much wine and then he says they the older women are to teach what is Good. Uh, the Greek here is a combination of two words. The first word means beautiful, and the second word means teacher. You are to be a beautiful teacher, older women. You are to be a beautiful teacher, teaching that which is good. Again, you are to be a virtuous example. Uh, an example to whom? Well, everyone really, but in particular, Older women, you are to be a beautiful teacher to the younger women. Yes, to women who are younger than you. And so what are you to teach these women, these women who are younger than you? Look with me at verse 4, and now we're going to look at the responsibilities of younger women. And so train the young women to love their husbands. Are you one of these younger women? It is your responsibility to be affectionate toward your husband. Are you one of these younger women? It's your responsibility to be maternal to your children. You see that? To, to love their husbands and children, but that's not all, and to be self-controlled. So just as the older men, in verse 2, are taught to be self-controlled, now the younger women are also given that command. You must be self-controlled. And then he says pure or chaste. 
You are not to be drawing attention to yourselves in a sexual kind of way. We all understand what he's saying here. Working at home. The idea is that these younger women are to be guards of the home, keepers of the home. Now, he's not saying that you, he, he's not forbidding women to work outside the home. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it is a special privilege and a responsibility to be a mom and a wife. How great a privilege, how great a responsibility is that? You do not have permission to abandon that, to uh, consider that as nothing. Be a keeper of the home. Loving your husband, loving your children. Kind is the next qualification here. Kind, or agathos in the Greek, it means to be pleasant. You, know, you, you don't want to be like that woman in the book of Proverbs uh, who is contentious and you know, it's, it would be better for his husband or her husband to live at the corner of the, the rooftop. You, know, you don't want to be that kind of woman. And then submissive to their own husbands. And this submission here is a willful submission, a willful submission of one's control. He is the head of the house. He uh, has been given authority by God according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so I'm going to respect that. Or respect that. Keep reading. Why should a woman do all of this? Why should a younger woman do all of this? Here's why. That the word of God may not be reviled or defamed or blasphemed so that people might not blaspheme the word of God. Here's what was happening in Crete. Again, this was a very promiscuous place. Uh, this was a place of idolatry, a, a place of sexual promiscuity. Just everywhere that people turned, there it was. Christians could not going around, they could not be going around preaching about the gospel and about the importance of righteousness and holiness. And then at the same time, the younger women of the congregation were going around sleeping around with other men. Not keeping the home. Claiming that they have freedom in Christ, they can do what they want. No, no, no. That's not the way that it works around here. And then verse 7. He turns his attention, or verse 6 I should say. Likewise urge the younger men. Okay, so we've looked at the older men. We've looked at the older women. We've looked at the younger women. Well, what about the younger men? Okay, here's what you must do, younger men. Verse 6. Be self-controlled. Some, now, there's differences of translation here. Some translations bear the idea that young men need to be of a sound mind or they need to treat life seriously. And if you know a young man who's not treating life seriously, then that's a big problem, isn't it? You know, someone who's not moving ahead. That could have been the idea that Paul has in mind. I think the, the idea is more likely that Paul is teaching these younger men. L listen, I get it. You have urges. You have desires. You have passions. But you cannot gratify those things just because you want to. You must learn just as the older men are learning and just as the younger women are learning. You too must exercise self-control. Verse 7. He turns his attention back to Titus. Titus, show yourself in all respects or in every way to be a pattern or a model of good works. Titus, if you're going to tell people what they must do, you also must show people how they must do it. To be a pattern of good works, a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Titus, I want you to be so full of faith and love that you go around and you are a 
a model of good works and that you invoke uh, trust and responsibility and people respect you and you are someone in the eyes of others who is a dignified individual full of integrity to the point where if people are going about saying things about you they're lying you know don't give them any ammunition to use against you if they're going to say things about you make it be that they're lying about you and that is to their shame and then finally Verses 9 through 10, Paul writes about bond servants. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now, we're free in Christ, right? Amen, we are. It would have been a very strong temptation for those who found themselves to be slaves and after they've obeyed the gospel to say, well, now that I'm free in Christ, you know, so long, you know, I, I no longer have to live in this arrangement. And Paul is saying, listen, sometimes life gives you a hand and you got to play with it, you got to roll with it. You know, Paul is not condemning slavery that's not his concern here he's saying what are you doing in the situation that you're presently in in the church at Crete it would have been a very interesting thing to see both master and bond servant together in the Lord on equal footing and then perhaps even in some of the local congregations there you would have had elders who would have been bond servants and then masters who would have you know, had to submit under the authority of their own bondservants. It would have been a very interesting dynamic. And Paul is saying, look, bondservants, you are to be submissive. And he says the same thing to younger women in verse 5. They, they are to be submissive to their own husbands. In a similar respect, bondservants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. Here's the point, and I, I don't want you to miss this. Situation does not absolve one from responsibility. You, you hear a lot of people today say, well, you know, my situation is different. Well, because I'm in this situation, you know, fill in the blank, that means that I, I get a free pass or, you know, I, I don't bear blame or I don't bear, bear guilt or I don't bear responsibility. Paul says, no, 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 no. Are you a member of the Lord's church? I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care if you're a man. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you are free, and I don't care if you are enslaved. You are responsible for something, and the same applies today. You know, we have universal responsibilities. For example, all of us must love one another. That rings universally true. All of, all of us must bear one another's burdens. All of us must encourage one and edify one another. These things are non-negotiable, but there are things uniquely yours which God is looking to you and saying, you're responsible for this. Wives, you're responsible for this. Husbands, you're responsible for this. Ministers, you're responsible for this. Older men, you're responsible for this. Older women, younger women, younger men. We can go on and on. Everyone has a job to do. Everyone has a burden of responsibility that he or she must bear and so my encouragement to you this morning is to keep on studying this book and to keep asking the question what does God want me to do how does God want me to live what does God hold me responsible for identify those things and then do it it's as simple as that it's as simple as that to say God what do you want me to do I'm ready to do it here I am reporting for service and I'm glad to do it to be a member of God's family, to be a Christian, is a special blessing. It, it is a, an abundance of blessings, really. But with those blessings come great responsibilities. Fulfill your responsibilities. Do your job. That's what God wants us to do as his children. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the blessing that it is to be a member of your household. 
Father, thank you for teaching us how to live. When we open up your word, we see what you want us to do. We see that older women are to train up the younger women. We see that older men must behave a certain way. We see that younger men must exercise self-control. We see that ministers and evangelists, those that teach your word, must do so in a particular way, Father. Help us to all work together. Help us all to be responsible for that which you have entrusted us as stewards of your many blessings, Father. Father, we want to be more like your son, Jesus. We want to be like him in all things. Help us to make that a reality in our lives. Father, we want to thank you for your grace. We want to thank you that long ago, Christ marched up Calvary's hill with a heavy burden across his back and that he paid the penalty for our sins and that through him and him alone, we might have a place at your table. We might have a place with you by your side forevermore. Father, if there is someone in our number this morning who does not have a place there at this present time, Father, we pray that he or she, whether that person is young, whether that person is old, whether that person is an employee somewhere, or whether that person is retired, Father, no, no matter the case, we pray that that individual will make a decision for you today. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The gospel is God's redemptive plan to save your soul. Jesus Christ died on a Roman cross some 2,000 years ago. The Bible teaches us that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And when we believe that Jesus has done that for us, when we believe that he is Lord and that he is Christ, and that when we are willing to turn away from a life of sin, gratifying ungodly desires in our body, when we are willing to make a commitment to God, to make a change for him, the Bible teaches us that we can confess what we believe to be true, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is Lord, that he is Christ. And if you believe that, and if you are ready to make a change this morning based on what you know to be true, the Bible teaches us that one can become a Christian by immersing or being immersed in water for the re remission, the forgiveness of sins. Baptism is what I'm talking about. If you've never been baptized, we want to study with you what the Bible teaches about that. And if you know what the Bible teaches about that, and if you are ready to be baptized this morning, you can. And maybe you have already been baptized, but for some reason you've not been faithful to the Lord. Maybe you've not been upholding your responsibilities. Well, how about this? You can walk down one of these aisles. I'll meet you halfway. And if you want us to pray that you might be a more responsible person with the things that God has given you, we can pray that prayer today. You know, the Bible says that we are to pray for one another. It also says we are to confess our faults to one another. And we do this not to shame anyone or to put anyone on the spotlight. We do this so that we might help one another. Because in the end, we all want to go to one place, and that is heaven above. And if for some reason you feel like you're not headed for that right now, Today's the day that you need to correct that. God has done what he has done. You know, he's given his son for you. He wants you to give, his, give your life to him. And so if you're ready to do that this morning, here's your opportunity while we stand and while we sing.